Rambo! Now we see Rambo more confident, a Rambo hell-bent on rewriting his own history. When I made the movie, I didn't see it like a political movie. I saw it as an action movie. In the 80s, the bad guy was the Russian, the good guy was the American, and it just was a natural progression of the story. Now he gets a chance, which is something that a lot of people don't in life. It's redemption. Mission recon for POWs in NAM. You interested? Yeah. Rambo was taken on a very strange connotation. Anybody who behaves badly is Rambo, whereas that's just the opposite of the way the character was created. He's not been the aggressor. He's going after the aggressors. I'm coming to get you. You're not expendable. I'll be at a gas station filling up my car, and some guy will come along and go, you're not expendable, Rambo. <laughs> Sir, do we get the win this time? This time it's up to you. That line caused a lot of people who had been in Vietnam to cheer. So I think we captured again that moment in history where people wanted to win the Vietnam War all over again. First Blood opened when we were in October 82, and it did not bad for, for that movie here and pretty good in the foreign. The normal thing is, what else? It's, I'm sure he's going to be doing something else. And we went to then a friend of ours who was very, who was roughly trying to get his own small movie together called Terminator. So Jim Cameron, and he's the one that started working on writing the sequel. The big difference in a Cameron script was that he wanted to start him out in a mental institution. The James Cameron screenplay, which was rich in description and had all kinds of it, it read almost like a novel. It was supposed to be Sly and John Travolta together, but then I don't know, it was, it was a decision made by the producers how it ended up. We were thinking about buddies, but we felt ultimately that this was the single white male, <laughs> you know? Between Sly, Cameron, and everybody, the idea was to go and rescue prisoner of wars in um, Vietnam. I always felt that they did exist, but how can we make this entertaining and deal with it, in, quote, in a Rambo fashion that people that served in the military would be given kind of this cathartic, even though it's somewhat fanciful um, uh, scenario where Rambo would go in there and basically do it on his own terms. The idea being that it was the politicians, those rotten bastards, if only they had stayed out of it, we could have won in Vietnam. In 72, we were supposed to pay the Kong four and a half billion in war reparations. We reneged. They kept the POWs. And you're doing the same thing all over again. And then came the point, who's gonna direct this movie? Mario Casar says, you'd like to do a movie, the, the sequel to First Blood? I say, I love First Blood, and I know Ted Kotcher is a good director. He says, well, we're sending it to you to read. So I read it and say, hey, I can do something with it. Ted had a more intellectual approach to the film, whereas George had a very visual and emotional approach to the film. We thought if we could get him to do it and get Sly to agree to it, we would be able to deliver the kind of film we wanted to do. George Cosmanos, who is a, is a very dear man, he, he upped it and George filmed a man, a Rambo character, who is a bit more flamboyant and we see the man for the first time truly at home in the elements. I mean, now we see what he was born to do. The casting of Rambo was not difficult because there was Richard Crenna, who I like a lot as a man, like I like Sly too. They were both already doing this thing before. I was thrilled when they were making a sequel. I was very much excited that they were gonna do another one because I loved playing the character. I loved working with all those people. It wasn't my war, Colonel. I'm just here to clean up the mess. Somehow I got a script and I glanced at it real quick and I went to the lot and uh, Salone came walking down the hall. I said, how you doing, man? He goes, hey, how you doing? I said, come on back. And anyway, I read for him. Go back to the agents. And I said, uh, that part you said was cast, I think I just got. Charles Dampier stood out as the number one bad guy. You think somebody's going to get up on the floor of the United States Senate and ask for billions of dollars for a couple of forgotten ghosts? Men, God damn it! Men who fought for the country. That's enough! I'm sure that Charles has had to walk through life being uh, looked at uh, askance by uh, the general population as a, as a kind of a bad guy, a guy that you wouldn't want to trust. Rambo, this is Murdoch. We're glad you're alive. People go, I hated you so much. Well, of course you did. 
That's what you're supposed to do, you know? Why were you so mean to Stallone? I had to be. Are you sure he's still not unbalanced from the war? It was a long process. It was like, first there was an audition with the casting director, then it was with the producers, then it was with uh, Stallone. It was a sense of unreality because this kind of thing just didn't happen very often in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I got back and I phoned from some phone booth that was out in the middle of nowhere. And I called them collect because I had no money on me. <laughs> and uh, they told me, uh, um, well, how would I like to go to Acapulco for 13 weeks? I wish I did it in Thailand, actually. My first choice for me personally was in Thailand. We went up to Chiang Mai, northern Thailand, and it was beautiful and stunning, but so difficult to work up in those jungles, you know? So somebody says, why don't we go to Mexico? So we all went to Mexico to look. I said, Acapulco says, has good jungles. I look, I said, how can Acapulco have good jungles? It's all nightclubs, you know? So right into behind Acapulco on the beach, it's all jungles. So like half an hour from the hotel, you find everything. So my, my thing was how to find the more interesting jungle, the boulders, the rivers, the waterfall, to give it a variety and try to make it as Vietnamese as possible. We even built a rice paddy and started growing rice to have it ready for the film because to give it the idea that you're in Asia. I said, I want a water buffalo to prove that I'm in Asia. We couldn't. They tried the cow, they put phony things. It's a joke. Mexico presented a lot of problems because of the logistics, number one. We've been through every realistic thing in the world, like mud. The heat, uh, the long hours. Snakes, like yesterday. Uh, I was caught three snakes, uh, you get trashes. Someone would get very mad at me, because I had the ability to stand there in my wool uniform and not sweat. He says, how do you do that? And I said, I won't allow myself to sweat. I think I went into a Zen mode. All of Acapulco got so flooded that nobody could get to the sets, and it took us a week to clean up the mess. As I wake up, there's five Mexican guys over me, over my bed. I say, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I look up, and the, the bed is in one foot of water. In the middle of a scene, you see a scorpion going up your leg, and you say, wait a minute, do you have an actor's guild card, or, I mean, are you a... <laughs> And because of the political situation, mainly having to do with permits and being able to get certain equipment into the country. We had the helicopters waiting in Texas, ready to come into Mexico. They said no. So we had to grease a lot of bombs and things to bring these bloody helicopters in. We're using a Mexican Air Force hangar, and there's a captain there. And he said, the general wants you to have a drink with him and Mr. Stallone. I explained to him that we can't do that today because we're filming right now and Mr. Stallone isn't here. And he said, no, you must go now or we won't have no more electricity. So we went over and had some drinks with him and um, then we could shoot, should do anything we wanted to, you know. And we had this huge Buddha made out of styrofoam and he wanted that Buddha. And I said, you can have the Buddha, but you, look, you, gotta, you wait till the picture's over. After that, everything was fine. You know, thousands of people go to Acapulco every year for vacation, so as an actor, you can't really complain when you go there to work. There were um, a few nights out uh, where we took the Slymobile out. You know, he became like the unofficial mayor of Acapulco. I don't think we stopped dancing until 2 or 3 in the morning. And Stallone keeps a grueling schedule because he's up in the morning and he works out every day without fail and every evening. And I have to say, it's probably one of the few movies I've done where the guy looks better than the girl. When I first met him, he probably weighed 185 pounds. That guy remolded his entire body. I've never seen anybody do that. I mean, you can't imagine what he put himself through. We'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. He would go in, work out on heavy weights, free weights, doing all kinds of exercises. We finished the day's work, a very hard day's work. He'd go back to the gym again and work out again. He was strong, very strong. It was about eight months of uh, training, four hours a day. Toughing myself up, uh, the 
SWAT combat courses, the archery courses, the uh, survivalist courses. I think the man is nuts because he's given himself things to do in this picture that nobody should ask of themselves. He worked his butt off in that moment. He went into diseased water, mud, he dragged himself. The technical advisors on this show, the men that have actually been through the tours of duty, keep me honest, keep the story honest. Yeah, dead center, how about it? In the movie, we take shots as far away as 185, 190 feet. Um, we got lucky on a couple of them. Sly did have another note <laughs> when he saw the picture. And I remember he called it arrow fly time. And it was the amount of time it would take for the arrow to go from the bow to its target. And he had me kind of lengthen. Whereas I had cut Sly, you know, letting go, and maybe I cut away. He wanted me to hold it a beat and then hold the next shot of you. Kind of worked. It's the old arrow fly time. Arrow fly theory. time, that's yeah, what he said. Yeah. They're both very good editors. But the only thing, I like to smoke a, a cigar now and then, and he hates smoke, so I had a problem. I had to leave the room and all that. And we used to joke about it because there was always a pile of cigarette butts outside the door. Right. Just a pile that high. The director of photography was Jack Cardiff. I remember when I was on location and I was actually working with him, I would be talking about stuff. And I was pinching myself, I'm working on a movie with Jack Carter, and this is the man who shot the red shoes. What a, what a great cinematographer. When you do an action movie, you have to make it different and original. And we had to invent actions going through the movie, so I started thinking, hey, how is he gonna kill more Russians today or more bad guys today? Well, they had a maiming montage, if you will, in the first picture. It seemed to work, so they put one in the second. Yeah. Been, yes. He kills this guy, he kills this guy, he yeah. kills this guy. And, and, and we do it fast, and you know, the audience responds like, whoa, you know? They really responded when he's covered in mud, yeah. and you rack focus to the eye, and the whole audience always right. went, oh, cool. So you had to think all the time how you're gonna do all those action scenes, which were all different. Most of the special effects were actually shot or created through the editing. We had multiple angles of yes. all these huts exploding, so I don't know how many huts explode, but they probably only had five on the set and 10 of them blow yeah. up. Yeah, and we used every one. And sometimes we'd use them twice. Yeah, we flop them and, and blow, blow it up, up again. Ah! And I also was a strong believer that you just don't fly a helicopter. You fly helicopters low, which is much more powerful because they give it strength and speed but also flying over villages, seeing human beings and things happening to them. Actually, one scene, one of the pieces we had fixed on the plane of the helicopter broke down and fell, and I said, leave it, it looks like, a, like an explosive, you know. I wanted to make it like a Western in the air, like a duel, you see at the end when they come facing each other, it's like a duel. No. Stallone, he wrote this little, like, a small love story, which I think makes him much more vulnerable, and that's very important. My character, Ko Bao, she only sees the vulnerability, and that's what moves her and touches her. You take me with you? I really fought to keep a kiss in there, because I felt that my character should should have a possibility of what could happen between them, of, of some sense of a dream that was in the making. And there's a potential of something really true there, a potential romance, which of course is nipped in the bud. And, and, and then, in a similar way to the first picture, that causes Rambo to snap. There was one ah. unintentional laugh that we ended up cutting out of the picture. Rambo is holding her in his arms, She's, she's dead, or she just, she dies in, in his arms. And then he let out this scream, no! And the camera popped out wider, 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 and the no echoed across the land, and the audience went wild. They started laughing hysterically, and Mark and I looked at each other and said, that comes out. <laughs> this is why we have previews. Towards the end of the picture, Rambo uh, had a little speech. The question that Troutman asked him is, what do you want, John? There were a number, quite a few takes. I mean, there might have been 12 takes on it. And then what had happened is the Sly answered this little monologue in very different ways. 
uh, in different, very different emotional ways. So you could play it any way you want it, from being very vulnerable and breaking down into tears to being very powerful and holding in his emotions, but actually being more angry towards the fact that the POWs weren't acknowledged and cared about. And we went through a great deal of back and forth on which take was actually the most effective. And Sly came in, and we were able to whittle it down and go back and forth until we found something that everyone was happy with. And then Sly had very strong opinions about that. I want what they want. And every other guy who came over here and spilt his guts and gave everything he had once for our country to love us as much as we love it. That's what I want. Sylvester Stallone is back as Rambo, First Blood, Part Two. The premiere, Rambo Two, Hollywood Boulevard. I don't remember whether I got to ride in a limo or not. I hope I did. We went in and instant, instant hit and everything. The movie flowing and people were yelling and cheering and whatnot. It was frightening. They were, they were, the theaters were packed. There were big lines. And we went around to the different theaters in town. They were still going nuts. And I began getting phone calls from strangers saying to me, I just saw the movie and I had to talk to somebody and I know you wrote the book and isn't it great? It's just such a wonderful, I mean, the adrenaline level was high. <laughs> One day Andy calls me there and says, God, it's doing incredible. You won't believe it. I said, what? Everywhere. It's crossed the board, actually. Japan was a huge hit. Southeast Asia was great. Australia, Germany. It made something like $26 million in five days, I believe. First Blood did about $57 million, the domestic box office, and it did about 70 something foreign. Rambo did 150 here and did over 200 something foreign. In today's standards, it's about $700 million, so. Not bad. Everybody stole from Rambo, you know. Really? They did the Russian Rambo with a blonde Russian actor. I don't remember now very well. It's years ago, but I know I know they did that. People copied it and copied it the, the way the action was choreographed, doing the, the bullets falling on the ground in slow motion and all that. The audience got so into it that they would start cheering after every killing. And of course, this was the Reagan era, so I guess it was appropriate, but it, it was wild. The idea that Rambo was a violent film, I never got that. It was a war movie. Uh, it was not like uh, gratuitous violence. In other words, it was one man with a weapon, another man with a weapon, both professional soldiers. Inevitably, one is gonna die. They always come down on Stallone for some reason. They did on the Rambo pictures. They don't come down critically on Schwarzenegger, on Chuck Norris. They don't come down on the other people who make uh, action films for the violence and the bloodshed in them. The word Rambo is now in the American dictionary, and it's there for the wrong reason. On my tombstone, it would say, here lies David Morrell, who invented a word whom few understood. Actually, I have a photograph that was sent by Reagan, where he stands in his jogging outfit. He's holding up a thing that says, Rambo is a Republican. The Rambo character be became kind of symbolic as, as uh, an individual who rises against oppression and will take matters into his own hands. We sort of tend to follow the flock, and Rambo is the kind of guy that gets up there and says, no, that's wrong, and I want to do it my way. Glad you made it! <laughs> oh! I said, I wish one day I'd make a movie, let people jump in the aisles. And my wish came true. Mission accomplished. 